Tonight's speaker is an incredible, incredible dear friend. Literally, not biologically, but literally my brother. <clears throat> if we think about the stories of the talents, this man, the way I, I guess the way I look at it is, is his journey with God is that God gave him one talent, and he did really well with it. God gave him two talents, good and faithful servant, and he did really well with that. He gave him five, ten. I don't know about you guys, but a lot of my church experience um, could be rough. Sometimes the leadership of a church and pastors are kind of distant and untouchable. Um, but tonight, Dan Hazen is far from that. He's very reachable. He's part of my inner circle. And to his, uh, <laughs> maybe to a little bit of his dismay, but uh, um, there's been a few 2 a.m. morning calls from me to him. I stayed at his house a couple times at night in my darkest darkest hour and he just sits there with me talks to me, listens to me hugs me, cries with me the man cries more than I'm the one going through the pain he cries for me in a way <clears throat> he is one of those guys that constantly seeks what is it that God has in mind for him and is very patient about it and seeking it. I'm going way over my time to introduce him, so I apologize. But I want to give this man due honor because he has been a pitiful, pitiful point in my life, of my walk, my journey. Um, and he is my brother, Pastor Dan Hazen. standing on the, a lot of shoulders this week, uh, George. Thank you for bringing it last week. And um, uh, Ed McDowell, who I found out I went to high school with, but only when we got together to talk about planning this. Ed McDowell? He was a senior. I was a freshman. He did not throw me in the shower. <laughs> he was a good boy. <laughs> uh, Aaron, what a great guy. And Vic. Uh, stand on their shoulders. A bunch of pastors. I'm, you know, I get the I get the title. I took uh, correspondence courses for a couple of years and got the whatever the okie dokie, the certificate, the thing that says I can whatever do this. Uh, but really, at, at, at the end of the day, uh, what's most important to me is I'm a novice monk. Yeah, I'm. Uh, I'm in the midst of a year-long training and reflection period to seek God's will and determine if I should take a vow to availability and vulnerability in the Northumbria community in Northeast England. No, I will not be required to leave my wife, wear a wool tunic, or have a worse haircut than even this. <laughs> but I will be required to make my vow, and part of that would be to embrace paradox. Now, through their God-given wisdom, the leaders of the Northumbria community recognized a central idea that runs unbroken through God's story. Really, it's a characteristic of God, uh, it, like his unchanging holiness, his, uh, his justice, his mercy, and his love. But it's a quality that we modern Western thinkers tend to fail to recognize, and that's paradox. And it's defined, one of the definitions is, a statement or proposition that seems self-contradictory or absurd, but in reality expresses possible truth. Paradox. Look at some of the paradoxes that we as Christians are called to embrace. Just a few. If you want to save your life, you must lose it. If you wish to be first, you must be last. To grow up, become like a child. It's in giving that we receive, in forgiving that we receive forgiveness, and the only way to eternal life is death. 
you think paradox is a central part of the Christian faith now, right? Here's a great example. Some of you may have heard this one. Don't give it away. Uh, 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 an ER surgeon and his son are driving down a highway one night. They're in a terrible car accident. The surgeon is killed. His young son is near death and is rushed to the nearest hospital. They bring the young boy in, rush him in. The ER doctor comes in, looks at the boy and says, I can't operate on this boy. He's my son. How's that possible? Somebody said it. The mother. Most of us don't get that right away, right? And here's why. This type of paradox is caused by the listener drawing hasty conclusions or bias. In this case, it's a bias against women being ER surgeons or against a couple sharing the same occupation. And so we draw a hasty conclusion that this paradox is a false one, but it's not. You follow me? We all get in paradox. Well, friends, our bias toward action and our hasty conclusions about manhood have uh, many of you lost in the paradox that Pastor Vic revealed to us back in week one. And I know some of you were confused by it because you came up to me and you went, what? So don't lie to me. Find out where you are. You know what the paradox is? Let me put it this way. Sometimes getting out of the boat means staying in the boat. That's a paradox. 99% of us look at the title of this book right here, and we correctly perceive it as a call to radical trust and risk-taking. And getting out of the boat is a metaphor for risk-taking, right? What if the risk you're supposed to take is to wait? What if that's the risk? 21st century Western guys make hasty decisions. Let's pull that up there. We reach conclusions way too fast. We're rewarded for moving quickly, and we are punished if our answer is ever, I don't know. Right? That's the scariest three words you could ever speak. I don't know. You live in a world that is hostile to waiting, and choosing to wait will require great courage and a willingness to risk, to walk on water by staying in the boat. 21st century Western guys are biased toward action. Being still is seen as feminine. Even if we don't know what we're doing, we'll do something. <laughs> There's a lot of heat, but no light. A lot of motion, but no movement. Wheel spinning, flame throwing, mud slinging, grandstanding, muscle flexing, shock and awe. <laughs> but there's still very little real courage when real courage calls us to wait on the Lord. What if the Herculean challenge God is calling you to is what Vic challenged you to do a month ago? Stay with your buddies in the boat. What if doing that takes all your courage and faith in Jesus? I'll tell you what it means. God has invited you into a paradox, and your hasty decision-making and biases have just been exposed. Bam! That's what it means. Psalm 27.10 says, Though my father and my mother forsake me, the Lord will receive me. Teach me your way, Lord. Lead me in a straight path because of my oppressors. Do not turn me over to the desire of my foes, for false witnesses rise up against me, spouting malicious accusations. I remain confident of this. I will see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. Wait for the Lord. Be strong and take heart and wait for the Lord. Do you hear the context for waiting on the Lord in this? It's battle. It's conflict, adventure, enemies. And the response? Wait. Guys, we have to change our thinking and start considering that being still, waiting on God, and choosing not to move might be the most courageous thing we can do. Don't be impulsive and leave your church as soon as you feel uncomfortable about a teaching that challenges you or the music gets too loud. Don't bail on your marriage when there's trouble, quit your job when it gets ugly, or walk away from a mortgage that you promised to pay because it's hard. Don't leap at the next spiritual trend that comes along. The latest church fad, the hottest teacher, evangelist, prophet, whatever, who promises you something, even if everyone else is going. Don't do it. So, am I saying 
Always wait, never act? Absolutely not. The point is, we are predisposed to move in our culture when moving is not the point. Being courageous and trusting Jesus is the point. Whether he calls us to sit on our hands or whether he calls us into the heat of battle. If you want to walk on water, you've got to trust Jesus. Think about it in terms of posture. Are you turned toward God? Are you facing him, ready to move or not, when he gives the command? Or are you looking the other direction? And will you expect him to command? Which is just another way of saying it's what you want to happen. What you feel God should be doing. What God owes you. The best example I can think of is a friend of mine that has a really badly trained hunting dog. <laughs> a retriever. You've seen this kind of dog, right? Maybe some of you own this dog. And the dog is just wants to do its job. It's just, I want to retrieve. Where's the ball? Where's the ball? Where's the ball? Where's the ball? All the time. And you pick up the ball, and you, you're supposed to tell the dog, right, heal. Dog's supposed to sit and watch and wait for you. And then you throw the ball, and the dog sees where. But this dog just goes, doing, and takes off, and you're over here still holding the ball. Right? You know this dog, don't you? And the dog's over there, and it gets about 50 yards out and stops and like turns around and looks at you like, what's wrong with you? I'm the one with the ball. I'm the one with the opposable thumbs here, people, right? <laughs> hey, dog. I'll make the decisions about where we go. Come on back. Is that you? <laughs> throw the ball! Throw the ball! And you're off somewhere down in the back 40. Don't be so arrogant thinking that you know what God has in store. I'm going to get out of the boat, and here's what God's going to do. James chapter 4, 13 speaks to you. Now listen, you who say today or tomorrow we'll go to this or that city, spend a year there, carry on business, and make money. Why, you don't even know what will happen tomorrow. What is your life? You're a mist that appears for a little while and then vanishes. Instead, you ought to say, if it is the Lord's will... We will live and do this or that. As it is, you boast in your arrogant schemes. All such boasting is evil. Questions? I think James got it. As he got out of the boat, I doubt Peter thought that God's plan was for him to sink like a rock and become the main character in a cautionary tale. I don't think that's what he was thinking. Now you might say to me tonight, well, but Hazen, you don't understand. I got a fire in my belly, man. I have this desire, and I'm sure God has put it there. It's all-consuming, and, and so I'm going to get out of the boat. Well, have you ever considered that this desire is what you're supposed to have, but it's not meant to be satisfied? That maybe all this desire is meant to do is change your posture, to tension you like a bow. cause you to wait, to lean forward, straining without release like a runner in the starting blocks. Philippians 3.12. Paul says, not that I have already obtained all this, or have already arrived at my goal, but I press on to take hold of that for which Christ Jesus took hold of me. Brothers and sisters, I do not consider myself yet to have taken hold of it, but one thing I do, forgetting what is behind and straining forward, to what is ahead. I press on toward the goal to win the prize for which God has called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. The anonymous author of a book called The Cloud of Unknowing describes the posture of waiting really well. And it's no sissy's undertaking, let me tell you. He says this, Look ahead now and never mind what is behind. See what you still need and not what you have. Now you have to stand in desire all your life long if you are to make progress in the way of perfection. This desire must always be at work in your will by the power of Almighty God and by your own consent. Living like that for a lifetime will take a pair. <laughs> but you see, this is not how we naturally handle desire, we humans. Humans tend to fall into two camps. There's what I call first the Eastern camp. Buddhism teaches that desire is the source of all suffering, and it should be eliminated. That's the goal of life. 
Eliminate desire and you get absorbed into the great nothingness, nirvana. Then there's the Western camp, which says desire should be surrendered to. Let it have its way and you'll be happy. Just let it run. That's the goal of life. So if desire is like a fire, then the Eastern thinker says, throw water on it. Put it out. Let it grow cold and die away. The Western thinker says, let it rip like a forest fire. It will consume anything and everything until it's gone. Now contrast that with how the Bible describes desire. Psalm 84, verse 2. My soul yearns, even faints, for the courts of the Lord. My heart and my flesh cry out for the living God. There's no quenching of desire here. And it's certainly not an unfocused, raging, consuming anything kind of fire. It's contained and focused fire. The fire is our longing for God, but the stone fire pit that surrounds it and contains it is waiting. And maybe you do have a a God-given mission, but God is staying your hand. Maybe he simply wants you to have that heartburn, leg trembling, up all night on your knees, brain-melting desire to walk on water. Because in those moments of burning desire and waiting, you are being changed. You see, here's the thing. God doesn't need you to do that thing that you're longing to do. He needs nothing. He didn't need Peter to walk on water. Was Peter really doing God some big favor? Do we really think that God is not going to get what he wants regardless of what we do or don't do? I'll tell you, when this came clear to me, when it settled into my heart, it was a moment I was praying, I was very frustrated uh, 10 years ago or so about a, a, a training class that I was leading and nobody showed up. I was mad. I was frustrated. How come we can't get people to show up? And I'm praying about it. And and, and I'm not a vision guy. You know, I don't tend to get those, you know, but especially this one because God gave me, oh, it turns out to be a comedic vision. So it's true. I don't know if it was really a vision or not, but so I'm, oh, just everything's ruined. And what are we going to do? And I kind of just got this snapshot of the armies of heaven advancing on the earth, right, from outer, and they're like in tanks and stuff, you know, big tanks and like battleships and everything, and they're just coming, and Jesus is at the front with a helmet and a cigar, ah, and he's coming, and you're gonna, it's the end of the world, and here it comes, and then his tank goes, out of gas, and he's, what the, how come, and they're like, Hazen's class didn't go through, and he's like, dang, all right, let's end the, oh, They all disappointedly wander back to heaven. Really? Seriously? And you know you felt this way. Don't lie to me. Oh, it all depends on what if it doesn't happen? What if it doesn't happen? Who are you? Your life is a mist. It's not about the risk. It's about the posture we take toward the risk. It's not about the risk. It's about your posture toward the risk. Are you willing to wait when your ego says jump? And are you willing to jump when your fear says wait? Will you adopt the posture of obedience to God no matter how that obedience makes you look? I want to show you a little video clip from uh, Star Wars Episode 1. Okay? (laughs) Watch this. Who's the mature one? Qui-Gon Jinn. Qui-Gon Jinn waits. 
he adopts the posture of faith. Faith in his God, in his training. He assumes his default posture of trust. He gets out of the boat by waiting. Contrast Qui-Gon Jinn's posture with Darth Maul. Are you in a posture where you spring into action from your center, from your default? Qui-Gon Jinn drops into a place of stillness, prayer, worship, the posture he will occupy for eternity. God, you are awesome. I feel your love. I trust you. I'm in communion with you. I'm ready to do your will. Then when God says, fight, bam, he's at it. Darth Maul and the rookie Obi-Wan, on the other hand, are completely caught up with their own desires, pacing back and forth, expecting their gods to do something anxious, to cut to the chase. We should be jumping into things less often. We should be obeying more. You see, Qui-Gon Jinn understands the paradox. You've got to stay in the boat to get out of the boat. And you know how his story ends, right? Death. You see, getting out of the boat or not is not about the outcome for you. It's about kingdom outcome. Qui-Gon Jinn died, but his death meant survival for Anakin Skywalker and Princess Amidala. And their survival meant the birth of Luke Skywalker, and Luke Skywalker was the savior of the whole Lucas galaxy. Does this sound familiar? Do you think George Lucas ever read the Bible? I don't know. But I know that Jonathan sacrificed himself by staying with his crazy father, Saul, by waiting. He got out of the boat by not rebelling against his father, the anointed king. And in doing so, he made it possible for David to survive. And David's survival meant the birth of Jesus of Nazareth. And Jesus of Nazareth is the savior of the real universe. Life comes from death. But too often, we seize control. We want what we want. And we want to walk on water. How cool. How miraculous. How simple. How selfish. God might have your death in mind. Are you brave enough to sit and wait for that? How many movies have you seen where the heroes are in some insanely tense situation and courage demands that they wait? Braveheart. As the English cavalry charges a bunch of Scottish tribesmen dressed like James... They're waiting, waiting till the last second to raise those pikes. Remember that scene? That's courage. Countless World War II movies where an Allied patrol sits in a foxhole waiting for the Nazis to come just a little closer before they spring on them. In those situations, courage is waiting. Cowardice is action. Man, if you want to walk on water, you do have to get out of the boat. But sometimes getting out of the boat means waiting in the boat. Don't just assume that you, you must jump to obey. Sometimes you must wait to obey. But either way, what is required is faith in your leader. Trust in his strategy and unwavering belief in his thinking. You better have a big God in those moments. And that brings me to my second point, my second idea tonight, and that's worship. Worship is the solution to a particular problem that occurs when we face risk. Let's imagine the Peter story differently, okay? Let's say that by the time Jesus was visible to the men in the boat, it was already sinking rapidly. It was halfway underwater when the eleven have jumped overboard and are safely trading water. But Peter is in the hold looking at Jesus through a porthole. Let's just imagine. They all cry out as if they've seen a ghost. And Jesus replies, do not fear, it is I. All of them are stunned, but Peter calls out, now nearly trapped in the sinking ship, Lord, if it is you, tell me to stay right where I am and I will be safe. Jesus replies, stay. 
To the men's horror, the ship disappears beneath the waves. But horror turns to wonder as a perfectly round bubble of air forms around Peter. He's safe and warm as the ship slips further into the murky depths. Peter's smiling and laughing, and looking up at Jesus through the water, when suddenly he becomes aware of how deep and dark and cold the water is, and the bubble begins to collapse. At the last moment, just before he's lost, Jesus reaches down, pulls him to safety, and says, Why do you have so little faith? Now, how is this version different in its substance from the real version? Well, it's not. Whether waiting or acting, if our God is too small, we're going to drown. And Peter's God was too small. That's the point. And there are two main ways that we misperceive God as too small. The first is this. He's not there at all. You're seeing God really small because it's true. God's not in what you're doing. And you've mistakenly placed some other lesser God where he should be. Success, self-satisfaction, religion, greed, sex, whatever teeny little God you tend to worship. 1 Kings chapter 19, Elijah has gone way off course. He's hiding in a cave when he should be elsewhere. And he's wondering why things aren't working out the way he thinks they should. Elijah witnesses a mighty windstorm, an earthquake, and a raging fire. God is not to be found in any of those big, enormous, world-changing processes. He's found in the whisper. Yeah, there are places that God is not. Sometimes it is just a ghost coming to you over the water. And if you're not familiar enough with the difference between the two, you're going to get wet. Brother, sometimes your God is too small because he's not involved in what you're doing. The second way God gets too small is because of our limited imaginations. We see the real God, but our perceptions are off. He's with us in the storm, all right, but we've got him crammed into a teeny little box that's only as big as our imaginations. It's like we're looking at God through a telescope backwards. This is what happened to Peter. Jesus was really there, and he really did tell Peter to come out on the water, but Peter didn't have a complete picture of Jesus at this point. Remember what Ed McDowell taught us two weeks ago. Peter was doing fine in his endeavor as long as Jesus was right-sized in his faith screen. It was only when Peter compared God to the wind and waves that God got too small and down he went. Now this is more than a common experience. It's the human condition. In scripture we're told in no uncertain terms that we do not possess the ability to see God accurately. Start with the fact that to see God clearly would mean death. Exodus chapter 3. And, and that's at his very core. His substance. He's altogether other than we are. Isaiah chapter 55 says, As the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. And most Christians secretly think they are the exception to this rule. It's true. It's a, a, well, not for me. I get it. You know, at AC3, we got stuck in the small God syndrome a couple of years back. We heard Jesus call us out of the boat to reach more lost people. We started a campaign. We called All In to raise money for a new building. We set a goal of around $600,000, and we thought we'd use that money to lease new space. In the middle of all that, God brought in a gift of land that by itself was worth $300,000. But he wasn't done yet. The land was then rezoned from residential to commercial, and was now worth over a million dollars. Wow. Look what God was doing. So we just blew past leasing a bigger building, and we bought one. I mean, we said, God, is that you? If it's you, tell us to come out. And he said, yeah. And we jumped. Good stewardship, right? Real estate's a sure thing. That was 2008. (laughs) Cutting to the chase. We lost a million dollars of God's money. Let me say that one more time. We lost a million dollars of God's money. We survived. AC3 is still here and doing her thing. But it was close. We sank like a rock, and Jesus pulled us out coughing and sputtering. In the years since, uh, we spent more than a few nights asking what went wrong. There are people who are still convinced that it was God's judgment on AC3 for some hidden sin. Maybe. I doubt it. If there's one thing you could say about AC3, it's that we don't hide our sins very well. You know, but, but God could have worked even through our sins, right? 
There are some who still think uh, we misheard God. Jesus didn't really say, get out of the boat. He had no intention of you taking such a big risk. Maybe. But I doubt it. I was at the dead center of that whole project, and we were on fire to reach more lost people. We were in the middle of God's clearly stated will, and more than one miracle kept us afloat. But God could have worked through our failures, right? I mean, God is not incapacitated by our errors, is he? No, I just think our God was too small. At least mine was. I think we lost sight of the fact that God is so big, he might just wreck us in order to accomplish his will. We saw a God who was only big enough to accomplish what we wanted. Let me say that again. We saw a God who was only just big enough to accomplish what we wanted. Job figured it out, and I'm not going to take the time to read the passage now. But I'd recommend that you do it. Job 38, 39 and 40. God goes on for two chapters explaining to Job just how big he is. And Job answers at the end, I am unworthy. How can I reply to you? I put my hand over my mouth, I spoke once, and I have no answer. Twice, but I will say no more. Here we are, AC3, a church full of believers who are at least as committed as the big church down the street or in the next town, but we still lose a million bucks? We were just as faithful as any group of Christians, just as conservative with the money. It's not like we went to Emerald Downs with it. I mean, we invested in real estate. So why did we lose? Why are there ministers and ministries out there who are crooks? I mean criminals. Who are dragging the name of Jesus through the mud, but we get all the resources they need. We don't get any of the resources they need to perpetrate crime. And we're struggling just to keep the lights on. It's because our God's too small. That's all. We didn't stop to imagine a God that's so immense, so beyond comprehension, so holy and so powerful that our part in his plan might not amount to as much as we thought it did. It's not that a million dollars isn't a lot of money to us. It's just that it counts for absolutely nothing to him. So how do we correct our view of God when we suspect that we have him undersized? In a word, it's worship, friends. And I won't spend a, a lot of time on this. In fact, let's just cut to the chase here. Uh, there's six things I want to hit on really quick. First of all, understand that worship is, in its simplest form, intimacy. Worship can be anything. Colossians chapter 3, whatever you do, whether in word or deed, do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, giving thanks to God the, God the Father through him. Anything you do, anything, can be an act of worship. Number two, remember everyone worships. It's just a matter of what or who. Your atheist friend worships rationality. Your friend with the big house worships mammon. Everyone worships. Make sure you got it right. Westerners have replaced the object of worship with the gestures of worship. I want to talk to you, brothers. Some of you think worship is only when you get the big whiz-bang thing right here and, and the whoosh, and you're looking for that, yeah! Some of you think the, the worship thing can only happen inside this little liturgical box with only this kind of a thing. You're, you're worshiping the gestures. You're worshiping worship. How many people know women who are in love with love? Guys, some of you are worship worship. And I'm not talking about style here. I'm not talking about whether you're a pew jumper or whether you sit in, you know, whatever. Okay? Pew jumpers. Love pew jumpers. Three, don't forego corporate worship. Guys, go to any church and sit in the worship service and it's mostly women. It's mostly women. Church has always moved forward on the backs of women because we won't pick up and take it. Guys, if you have a worship opportunity at your church, your butts better be there. You better be there. But that leads us to the next one. Don't make corporate worship your sole expression of worship. If that's all you ever do, you are sorely in trouble. Number five, don't be afraid of nature. Don't be afraid to get out there. I challenge you to do this. Find some place where nobody will hear you. Get out in the middle of the boonies and shout God's name as loud as you can. And feel it and feel the stress in your lungs and feel the air rush back in. Pick up a leaf and look at it and notice the pattern in it and how it's reflected in the lines of the palm of your hand. That's the creator God. Don't be afraid of that. It's worship. And number six, don't be afraid of art. Movies, 
galleries, sacred art, loud music, touchable art. God can speak to us through art, any art. Was George Lucas trying to teach a Bible lesson? No, but can God still use it? You bet he can, he just did. Can God speak through a Picasso or a Chihuly, Beethoven's Fifth or a Rage Against the Machine song? My God can. Look, is there art that God does not approve of? Of course. Is God somehow in all art? No. But is God limited to the Bible or liturgy or leadership structure or only songs produced in Franklin, Tennessee? <laughs> is the Bible a containing factor of the creator of the universe or can he speak to you through the storm, through the earthquake, through the whisper, through the elk bugle, through the ballerina? Is your God limited by the Bible or can he occupy anything he wants, anytime he wants? Does he speak only in songs written before 1890, or can he speak through a Led Zeppelin tune? I don't care what Robert Plant or uh, Jimmy Page meant by the immigrant song. My God is big enough to occupy that song and declare his glory through it. Ah! <laughs> I've been waiting all week to do that. How big is your God? Didn't Joseph say to his brothers, you meant it for evil, but God meant it for good. He can turn evil around. Does the Bible define God or does God define the Bible? And if he can do that, do you think he can speak through ocean waves or even a painting of ocean waves? In your imagination, is the Bible a leash that restrains God and holds him down or is it a sword that he lifts up? that he freely swings? Can he pick up any tool at any time and use it for his purposes? If he can swing this sword, this awesome, life-giving, inspired and inerrant miracle, can you imagine the hand that wields it? Can you imagine the arm that supports that hand? Can you imagine the body that that arm is attached to and the mind that makes it all work? How big is your God? Wait on him and worship him. I'm, I'm way over, but I'm just going to take another minute because I want to sing you a song, okay? This is a part of that. I mentioned I'm a monk or a novice monk. This is a song that's part of the evening office, the evening canticle. And it comes right from Psalm 27, and I want you to hear this. In the shadow of your wings I will sing your praises, O Lord. In the shadow of your wings, I will sing your praises, O Lord. The Lord is my light, my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the refuge of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? In the shadow of your wings, I will sing your praises, O Lord. I believe I shall see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. Oh, wait for the Lord, have courage and wait, wait for the Lord. In the shadow of your wings, I will sing your praises, O oh Lord. See that you be at peace among yourselves, my children, and love one another. Follow the example of good ones of old, and God will comfort you and help you both in this world and in the world which is to come. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit.